One of the things that people who are watching and listening might be interested in knowing is that people pursue different mating strategies, so to speak. That's, that's how evolutionary psychologists or biologists describe it. And you can make the same case in the animal kingdom to some degree. And uh, there are short-term mating strategies, and that would be associated with an ethos of the glorification, let's say, or the practice of casual sex, so sex without relationship. And uh, one of the questions that you might ask is, are there pronounced differences between people who tend to pursue short-term mating strategies versus long-term mating strategies? Now, a long-term mating strategy would be accompanied by the formulation of a relationship of mutual support that's what makes it sustainable. And uh, the answer is, well, yeah, there are marked differences. Uh, one of the hallmarks of antisocial personality, and so that's the personality characteristic set that is associated with criminality, is a proclivity towards short-term mating strategies. And that is associated with early onset of sexual activity and multiple sexual partners. And then in its more pathological form, a predatory or parasitical uh, 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 lifestyle in relationship to sex. And so that has been elaborated more recently into the analysis of so-called dark tetrad personality characteristics. That's an emerging model of the malevolent and pathological personality. And that involves Machiavellianism, which is manipulative, um, Narcissistic, which is virtue-free attention-seeking. It's a good way of thinking about it. Psychopathy, which is predatory parasitism. And sadism, which is positive delight in harm to other people. And those, all of those delightful characteristics are associated with a striking proclivity for short-term mating. And that brings up the stark realization that it's a form of exploitation. That's a good way of thinking about it. And it's fundamentally the exploitation of women because here's a good way of defining women since we don't know how to do that in our society anymore. We might as well start with basics. And throughout the animal kingdom, and this is true all the way from sperm and egg up to fully embodied being, the female is almost inevitably the sex that pours more resources into reproduction. So that means that women have a higher, bear a higher cost for sexual reproduction in case anyone's still too stupid to actually understand that. Might as well make it explicit. And what that also means is that um, if there's exploitation going on in a sexual relationship, it's most often, although not always, the male who has less at stake exploiting the female who has far more at stake. And it's enticing for young women to believe, I suppose, if they want to pursue hedonic pleasure that they can escape from that reality, but it's very difficult to. So that's one element. Then the next element with regard to morality is if you're playing a game that only works in the short term for others, but also for yourself, then that's not a very good game. And you know, the point you were making was that Marilyn was playing a particularly short game and even Hugh, who had less to lose, and arguably on some dimensions more to gain, he was still pretty damn pathetic by the time he hit, I would say, what, mid-50s? I watched one of his late TV shows where he was touring Europe with his three blonde bimbos who were not the world's, they weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, let's put it that way. And it was Hugh and his three blonde clones traipsing painfully from faux glamorous restaurant to faux glamorous restaurant through Europe, engaging in conversations so puerile and painful that anyone with any sense would have run away from the table screaming after five minutes. So he turned into his own parody. And that was quite clear. I mean, anybody with any sense at all, no matter how much they might have been enamored by his young and hypothetically glamorous self, if you had looked at that with a cold eye a few decades later, it was looking, it was looking pretty oldest boy at the frat party. Uh, 
had that whole stench about it, I would say. So, all right, so back to Marilyn. You said that she had a pretty brutal upbringing and was exploited pretty early on. You might as well tell the story about her, uh, the famous photographs that launched Playboy. Uh, yeah, so, so Marilyn was the, both the first cover star and also the, the first naked centerfold in the first issue of Playboy. But the naked photos were acquired without her consent. She'd taken them, well, she'd had them taken many years before when she was much younger for very little money just because she was desperate. She'd signed the release with a false name, but somehow Hefner got hold of them and paid the photographer rather than her in order to publish them in Playboy. And she wasn't even sent a free copy and was apparently very upset about it. Hefner ended up buying the crypt next to hers at the... Um, the cemetery in Los Angeles where they're both buried, obviously buried many decades after she was, but they never actually met in real life. So this whole kind of relationship between the two of them was very much initiated by him. And I mean, this, this is the point that I want to make with um, talking about Marilyn Monroe. She, she is very typical of female sex icons in having this kind of tragic backstory, multiple forms of exploitation, by lots of people, most of them men. And, and yet she is held up as this, um, this iconic figure of the, of the sexual revolution, which we're supposed to believe was a good thing. <laughs> right, and my argument in the book, it, it is of course the case against the sexual revolution. My argument is not that it was entirely bad. I don't think you can paint any huge historical event as entirely bad or entirely good. But I think that it has been falsely presented mostly by progressives through rose-tinted spectacles. And this is my attempt to counter that. Yeah, well, there's no doubt she was an iconic figure and still is. And part of the reason, it's hard to say exactly why. I mean, there's something obviously hyper-attractive about her. And I heard her interviewed once in a radio station where she said she could walk down the street. I believe her, her genuine name was Norma Ray. Is that right, Norma Ray? And she said she could walk down the street as Norma Ray and no one would look at her, or she could walk down the street as Marilyn and then people would just be attracted to her like mad. And so I want to run a hypothesis by you, you know, given that, uh, that backstory for female sexual icons, and this is often the case for girls who get dragged or who agree to participate in the pornography industry, that, you know, they're often abandoned girls who have a history of, fractured relationships and abuse. Now, so here's, here's a hypothesis. You know that girls without fathers hit puberty one year earlier, eh? That's a real biological mystery, but here's a hypothesis. So imagine that you're bereft of male companionship and productivity and protection. And maybe that's because your culture doesn't have enough men, sometimes that happens after wars, for example, or maybe you're just in an economic niche or a social niche where you're unfortunate, you know, so. Now, why would you develop a year early from a puberty perspective? Well, the answer is, well, one of the ways that women can attract male attention, obviously, and therefore, in principle, companionship, protection, productivity, all of that, that that might come along with a real relationship is by being sexually attractive and available. And so if there's a dearth of males in the local environment, then early puberty could easily be a way of uh, increasing the probability of catching a mate early enough so you don't starve to death, let's say. Okay, so then imagine that there's a psychological equivalent to that. And this is where that waif-like femme fatale archetype might kick in. And so if you're appealingly, vulnerably beautiful and available, and then you have that, that magic that, goes, that can go along with that when it's transformed into something truly archetypal, which Marilyn did extraordinarily well. You know, there's a bit of a little girl about her. She had a very girly voice and that's how she sang. And she had a a kind of innocent, naive provocativeness that was amplified paradoxically by her overt sexuality. And so she had some of the appeal of a helpless child and some of the appeal of a, a truly mature woman. 
And that's a pretty, that can be a very deadly combination. And I think the fact that it's a deadly combination is also a kind of adaptation. So you can imagine that girls who are abused might turn to that, that pattern of seductive uh, behavior because it's, they, if they turn on the charm full throttle in that manner, it increases the probability that even in their desperate economic straits, they might be able to attract a male. And of course, with Marilyn, that was elevated right to the point where she became literally the poster girl for that approach.